Welcome to Ask Girl Anything. This is the show where your questions make the show. And if I don't have questions, I don't have a show. This is for February 2022. Um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. I was trying to think about what the first thing I wanted to say is. First off, I want to say this is my fifth year of doing Ask Girl Anything. And it officially started in 2018, February of 2018. I think it was my first episode of Ask Girl Anything. Um, I've had over 100 episodes, and I have some people that are still watching them. I had a new guy that's just been started following me, uh, I guess recently, and he just started saying, yeah, he started at number one. He's going all the way through them. So thank you. Anybody who watches my show, of course, I want to thank. I thank everybody that subscribes and watches the show and gets something out of the show. This month I have a lot of questions. So one of the things I'm contemplating right now is will I do a second show? Meaning I do all the questions now and then I cut it into two shows. So that's a possibility and if that happens, there'll be a, I'll do some kind of a special new front end for the next one and you'll all know what happened as I drop off. I'll start to know that as I start doing this show. Couple more administrative things. Um, I said at the last show that I'm going to try to start downshifting. You really couldn't tell I downshifted in the month of January. I was on um, uh, the drummer's key. Uh, my friend Chris, I was interviewed by him. And that was an exciting show I was on. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about me, Chris had a nice interview with me. He's interviewed other guys like Rich Raw Dog and a whole bunch of other guys. Um, Ash Wells, a couple others. I'm, I'm, I'm off doing this off the top of my head, of course, as usual. There's nothing new with me. I riff. That's what I do. It's my jazz musician background. It's quite cold here today in South Florida, and I should be wearing a sweatshirt, but I'm not. Um, we actually turned the heat on for the first time in, I don't know, at least five years. I don't remember the last time we turned the heat on, but I think it's because we had the grandkids over this morning. And this morning was made up of me doing drum covers on this kit. And one was with my grandson, Asher, filming. So it was kind of cool. Um, I taught Asher some things on the drums today. And I taught him how to change drum heads. I put some new pinstripes on these toms. So I'm digging the sound with the pins. And I think it's going to be really the right sound for these drums. And I needed a new sound. The uh, Remo Emperors were kind of doing it you know weren't doing it for me anymore I needed a different sound so anyhow back to my you know like <laughs> I just just stream of consciousness went off to that but um it's kind of funny I've got colored lighting coming at me I've been working on lighting matter of fact the reason why I'm working on lighting is I just saw a video from Chris at drummer's key about lighting if you want to watch a good video about basic lighting for drum covers uh, he did a great job. I gotta give Chris a lot of, a lot of credit for that. So this is a kind of a shout out to Chris and his show, um, under the drum covers, which I've been featured on now. Also this month in January, I, um, did a drum collaboration, which I hadn't done one of those in years. I think the last time I did a drum collaboration was somewhere in the neighborhood of 2018. Um, where I did something with somebody. I can't remember anyone before, after that. So it was probably in 2018. But um, I did a drum collab with drum the drum addict, my friend Eric, who makes snare drums now. So check out his snare drums. Um, but we did, we did a song called um, All the Way to Kingdom Come by Rich uh, Mullins. And I also did a segment where I, he talks at the end of his videos and I always, I dig what he does at the end of the videos. I haven't done that to my videos because I know a lot of people don't watch to the end anyhow. And I have these talking videos where I talk to you, but, um, anyhow, Eric, let me talk. And I talked and we had about a 15, 20 minute conversation, I guess, total, or maybe 12, 13 minutes. I don't know. But he put the whole conversation on as a bonus that week. So you can see me giving a little bit of my other side of my life, which is my, you know, my Christian experience side, my spiritual side of life. Because I think, I, you know, life is balanced in living in the real world 
and also living in the other world, you know, the other realm and understanding that there's another realm to this life. And I've had that experience for a long time. You know, I kind of experienced God when I was like 10 years old as a little kid. Um, I used to, and this is a personal story. I, I just feel like sharing today, you know, it's been that kind of a month. Um, this is a personal story. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I lived on a street in New Jersey and we, it was, it, it kind of butted up against a cemetery and the cemetery was kind of our playground. We played soccer, football, and baseball in the cemetery. And, um, I remember this distinctly. I was like 10 years old and I had just slid into second base and we lost the game and I was looking up into the sky and I saw the clouds. It was a beautiful summer day and the clouds were big and puffy. And I looked up in the sky and I I really sensed God there because I was afraid of God. I used to go to a Catholic church and I was very afraid of God when I would go in the church. And I would just become an altar boy. So I was one of those kids who was an altar boy too. Yeah, you can, you can basically call me whatever you want at that point as a child. But the funny thing was I was afraid, afraid of God. And it, it was in that cemetery looking up at the sky that I first met God and I sensed his love for me. And I wouldn't call it a born again experience at that point. I would have that in college, in my in my um, faith. But I will say it was a, a touch point where God came down and touched me. So my spiritual side is pretty important to me, and that's why if you want to learn a little more about that, go to Eric and the Drum Attic and check out that little interview on me there. So I'm really hawking myself in these things I'm talking about today. Um, the other thing I did was. Um, this was an ad of the blue day, drum man 190, Matthew called me up one day and apparently his partner in crime for um, his live show, his interview show, uh, five at five, I think he calls it. Um, his partner in crime, John had some problems that day. I think there was a storm or something came through where he was and he was out of power. And Matthew said, Hey, do you want to jump in and want to help out? And I did an interview with Stanton Moore and Matthew, and it was very impromptu. It was on my lunch hour. It was kind of funny how it all worked out. It was perfect timing. It was about my lunch hour. So I took about an hour and 15 minutes and spent some time with Matthew and Stanton Moore and got to ask Stanton Moore a few questions. So that's another thing I did in the month of January. I also started a new show in the month of January, which is called Conversations. Um... Life, love, wisdom, and drums. I think I said it right. And my first guest was my good friend, Scott Hazen, who I've mentioned on this show many times about drum trades. We talked a lot about drumming, and he gave a really interesting perspective of me as a 16-year-old kid taking lessons from him. So if you want to check that one out, I had a lot of fun with that. And this weekend, I just dropped my second in that series, with um, CCM drummer Matthew Jackson. And that's an interesting story. Many of you know Matthew Jackson, knows CCM drummer as the guy that does exact drum covers and will kind of tell you why you should do it that way. But he's really a nice guy and you really should check that out. So for all a whole month of January being a month of pretty much busy, 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 I didn't really, I don't think I missed a day on drum covers either. Um, I would say it was, I didn't downshift. Sorry about that. But with that said, I've got a lot of questions for Ask Girl Anything. And all I can say to you is I'm going to keep pushing on some things. I have a couple more shows coming out. Um, I was hoping to record a show about my new snare drums, my Black Beauty snare drums. And comparing it to other brass snare drums, because I have a few other brass snare drums. So that will be coming at some point. Um, I just picked up a Peisty 2000 sound reflector top to go on top of my Peisty 2000 regular medium sound edge hi-hat bottom. And they sound kind of nice. So I don't have to use my Peisty 505 bottom on them. A lot of guys ask me about my hi-hat sound. I've been trying to go for the 2002 sound, but I haven't bought 2002s. So. Um, maybe someday I'll buy 15 inch 2002s, but these Peisty 2000s are really nice symbols. So I may do something about Peisty 2000s and 505s and Peisty symbols and update on that. Because I've gotten a few new ones in 2020 
and 21 that I have not done any discussion on. So there's a few more things coming talking wise for those of you that dig these talk format shows. Anyhow, let's jump into today's questions. Let's see where we end up. Let's see how long this show is. Let's see if I cut it in half. So uh, this is a leftover question. I may have even answered this question. I'm not going to cut it. I'm going to give you another answer on this. This is from AR drummer Adam, a good friend of mine. By the way, he's selling some drums. So if you want to see Adam, some of Adam's stuff, and you're looking for snare drums, he's got a couple up there on Rever his Reverb site. Check Adam out. Um, Adam says, always a wealth of info. Um, what are your hobbies? He says his latest is dirt bikes. Now, I don't know if I answered this question or not. I think I did answer it, but I'm going to say this. I don't really have hobbies. Um... I don't even consider drumming a hobby for me. Um, drumming is just life to me. But, um, you know, I'm not the normal guy that likes football and all that stuff. And I mean, it's not like I don't watch football once in a while. I will with a friend. But really, um, my life's about my kids, my grandkids, my family, my wife, and drumming in the studio so that's really what I do with myself and that's pretty much what occupies my time so I did, I've never had a Harley and never had a Corvette I didn't go through midlife crisis um, I kind of got threw myself into life pretty young at 22 got married and by the time I was um, 27 I had my third child but I had two in the first, by 23, I had two kids. Um, that's a long story. By the time I was 37, one of my daughters made me a grandfather. And I've been a grandfather since 37, so I didn't really have a midlife crisis, to be honest. I have 10 grandkids today. Um, my oldest being 24, my youngest being, he's going to be four this week. So that kind of gives you the gap, the range of life for me. And... Um, so grandkids, wife, kids, church, family, fellowship, studio, making music, recording. That's really what I do. So that and my day job. So lots of excitement there. Not a lot of hobbies, though, which you call hobbies. All right. That was just in case I forgot this. Now, I got a bunch of long questions today. So I'm going to jump in the first long question, I think. This is from Dirk Ayala. I think that's how you say it been down here in South Florida long enough. Ayala. I think that's how they would A-Y-A-L-A. -A -A. I don't know. Maybe Dirk, you can tell me I said it wrong. <clears throat> he said, uh, wasn't up early enough for the Ask Girl Anything. By the way, when I, when I release Ask Girl Anything, every once in a while, I will do a premiere. Um, on that particular one, I didn't do a premiere. He loved my B-Stock story. Okay, I'm just catching up. A little idea is your channels. Um, let's see. Here's the question. It's always finding the question sometimes because I get a nice story with the question, which I love the stories, by the way. Keep sending me stories of your life. He said, I did a whole five-year hiatus on drums until earlier in 2021. I'm just starting to shop again for gear. Um, the sticker shock is unreal. Um, been to two different shops, kept thinking, what happened to a buck an inch? <laughs> buck an inch. I don't know what that even refers to. You talk, I think he's talking about drum heads. A buck an inch for drum heads isn't happening that way. That's for sure. I mean, a 10 inch pinstripe is like 16 bucks now. It's crazy. Um, but let's go into it. So he said, next question for next month. If and when you still do regular practice regimen, do you do standard X number of minutes on hand techniques, X number of minutes on full kit workout, and then song work? Or do you just do something slightly different these days? All right, Dirk. Here is the answer to that question. First off, when I practice, um, and it's not consistent in any stretch or, or way, I have a lot of different ways I practice. Some t I have a practice pad off the side of my desk and sometimes when I get a little bit distracted I'll sit there and do some of the Gadamant book there's two exercises the first two and then I'll try to go through a couple other exercises in the Gadamant book 
and um, but it's the warm-up exercise, which is double strokes, um, eight double strokes, right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. Then it goes to eight single stroke roll, digga, 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 30 second notes. And then it goes to a paradiddle, paradiddle, right paradiddle, left paradiddle, and it stays in rights. So digga, 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 digga. I, I can actually do it on the hi-hat. It stays with rights. And then at, at one point, the last, the fourth time it goes. Then it goes to lefts. Then it goes back to rights. So that's one of them. The other one is the second page, and I usually do a match grip too, because I practice match grip more than I practice traditional, but I may do traditional once in a while like you just saw me do. And it's it's back and forth. So it starts with rights, then it goes to a flam, a right, left, right, right, then it goes to flam, right, flam, and then it starts with a left, left flam. Left, right, left, left. So let's try it again. Let's try it again. It ends on a right. That's the fourth bar. And then it starts with lefts. to rights. Anyhow, that's something I do on a pad. And I'll do singles, doubles, paradiddles, flam taps, and I'll just goof around. Uh, as far as drum kit stuff, every once in a while I'll come in the studio and I'll sit down and I may read some Realistic Rock or the Jim Chapin book or the Funk Drummer Workbook by Chet Dobo or Triplets Around the Drum Kit or Phil's Around the Drum Kits by Paul Cazzullo. I forget. I think that's how you say his name. It's an old, old book. These are some old books I pull off the shelf and just throw up on the stand. Or I do syncopation exercises. I have one that John Robinson showed me with triplets and accents. And I goof around with that. But th then again, this is not anything regimented. This is just me just doing it. And then, as far as practicing songs, I only practice songs when I'm playing for church. I'm trying to learn it for a band, a gig. Or when I'm doing drum covers. And when I'm doing drum covers, I learn the song on camera, believe it or not. I turn the cameras on and I start practicing it. And usually most of the drum covers I do are done within one hour. Every once in a while, I'll run into a drum cover that took me an hour and 10, an hour and 15. And usually there's some technical issues in there too, meaning... Something's going on with the recording, something's going on with the mix, something's going on with the headphone mix. Uh, there's a sound bothering me and I get kind of distracted and I have to fix those things. Because part of recording drum covers is right brain, left brain. Left brain is doing all this technical stuff, your right brain wants to do all this creative stuff. So I have to switch back and forth between left brain, right brain a lot to do these drum covers. So when I'm practicing these drum covers to do them, and that's the only time I really work on new music is I'll just turn the cameras on and play. And every once in a while, I'll get one in five minutes. There's been plenty, like there's, there's this Gordon Lightfoot song I did, Sundown. I think it took me uh, 12 minutes total. I mean, literally turn the camera on, play it one time, backed it up, played it again, and then played it a third time. And that was nine minutes. I think the song's three minutes and five seconds or something stupid. And I literally just sit here, okay, do it again. Do it again, that's it, done, take the cameras. It takes longer to put the, the, the mix and the cameras together. And I probably did that all in probably about a half hour, 45 minutes tops for the video. Some videos I spend 45 minutes on the song. 
Sometimes I have spent an hour on a song. So I don't really practice songs is what I'm saying. I just play them and then learn them fast. So that's my thing. But great question, and thank you for asking that question. My next question comes from Karen Kalsey, and she said, this was on an Ask Girl Anything. I hope you watch, Karen. Um, she said, um, do you have to be able to read music? She has two questions. The next question is going to come up after this. Um, I don't think you have to read music, but it helps. Um, reading music can expand you in ways that you can't expand without reading music, but you don't have to read music to be a drummer. You just have to hear it. Matter of fact, there are guys that can read the music but have no groove and no feel. And I think that I'd rather be a drummer that had feel that picked it up by ear than be a drummer that can read the notes but has no groove and no feel. So groove and feel is something you have to listen to to, to learn. Reading, though, will help you in working on hand exercises and doing things to practice that if you have the ears, you can do. So is reading important? Yeah, it's important. If you want to be a professional drummer, you want to take it to another level, reading becomes extremely important. If you want to do lots of different gigs and you don't want to get stuck doing one gig, reading can be very important. Um, but do you have to read to be a drummer? No, you don't. You don't have to read. And if that's boring you working on reading, you need to find a teacher that'll work with you on showing you patterns. Now, if you can't pick up patterns, that's why they usually go to the book. The book starts showing you some things and you can start learning patterns from the book. But uh, I think reading is important. I just don't want to say you have to be a drummer and you have to read. So I'm not going to say that. Now, your second question, which was actually your first question, says, can anyone be taught drums at any age or does natural talent help? I think I'm implying that in that answer to the last question. I think that if you have ears to hear the music and you can feel music like dance or groove along to it, you know, if you can do those things, then you can have that's natural ability and that's very helpful being a drummer. But I do believe you can be taught how far you will go with being taught. That's another that's up to you. And I think that at some point, everybody hits their peak of how far their natural ability goes and how much they're going to push hard enough to get past to the next place to push their natural ability further from working hard at it. I think I had some natural ability, but to be honest with you, one of the things that made me the drummer today that I am is that I had this one thing that did not allow me to stop, which is I'm pretty tenacious about when I want to do something, I'm going to do it. And if you don't have that, then a lot of times what happens is, what happens basically is you quit. Now, I have met people that get it really early in life. They figure out how to do certain things they love doing while they're children. And then they go to college and they study it. And then they come out of college and they can do it. And then they quit. And I don't know if I've ever told this story on um, Ask Girl Anything, but I met a guy who went to the University of Indiana on an airplane one day. I fly; I used to fly a lot for business, and um, I got bumped from coach to first class. That's how much flying I did at that time. And the guy I was sitting next to in first class figured out I was a musician because I left my magazines in my coach seat. So I said to the flight attendant, I said, can you go get my magazines for me? I left them in my seat. She said, no problem, Mr. Ben, and I'll bring them to you. So she brought them back. I had Modern Drummer and Sound on Sound magazine. And the guy sitting next to me said, hey, are you a drummer? Are you a musician? And I said, yes, I am. And I have a recording studio. I started talking to him. And he said to me, he said, you know, I used to be a drummer. But I gave it up when I was like 25. I said, oh, wow, well, that's, that's interesting. I know, I know a lot of guys, they you know, have to give it up for one reason or another. He goes, yeah, I didn't have to give it up. Matter of fact, I, I left at the top of my game, pretty much. Um, he went on to tell me that he went to the University of Indiana, the same university that Kenny Arnoff went to. He was in Kenny Arnoff's class. He was one of the top 
symphonic guys in the school. And I think he went on to work with one of the big symphonies in California, possibly the San Francisco S Symphony Orchestra. But I could be wrong on that. But he told me he, he, he went to the top of the game, was doing it. And at 25, he sold all his gear and all his equipment. And he quit and he got into his business that he was in. And he's quite successful at his business. But he gave it all up. And when I got done and I got off that plane, I reflected on that particular time with this guy on a plane. I realized that some people get it and it comes so natural to them. It's so easy to them. There's no hard work. They hit, they plateau at a certain point and they quit. I don't need to do the same. I need to do something else that challenges me. I didn't have that. I wanted to do this as a kid and it took me my whole life. And I can tell you that I'm playing drums better today than I ever played drums when I was a child. Now, I took gigs and opportunities and did all kinds of stuff and I've worked hard, but I think my drumming, my groove, my pocket, my time, my feel is a thousand percent better than it was at 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. I mean, I built this studio when I was 39 years old in New Jersey, brought it to Florida, did my wife's album. And I can tell you that my recording, playing on, rec on records has gotten so much better because I do this all the time. I play on stuff all the time. And it's become a lot more, I feel it. I get that pocket thing. So you need natural ability. But also, you can work past your natural ability and continue prog progressing if you want to study and go further. And part of that is practice, part of it is listening, and part of it is not letting your passion go. I think that's why the first question that was asked by Adam, what are your hobbies? I don't have any hobbies because this is what I do for fun. This is my fun for me, playing drums. I love playing drums. It's not about collecting stuff, even though I've got quite a collection of gear. It's about playing the gear I buy. If I buy something, I want to play it. I don't buy stuff just to have. Everything I have in the studio I use and I play. That's the key. I love what I do. But I will tell you that my natural ability as a child was not as great as others. So I had to work hard to get past it. So you can work hard and you can get there. And I feel like I'm still growing as a drummer. So that's that's the good thing. That's why I keep doing this show. That's why I keep doing covers. That's why I keep having fun with this. Because for me, I'm still learning. And if you're learning, you're growing. And if you're growing, that's a good thing. All right. The next question came on the, co on the cover, Midnight Confession. And it came from a drummer named Midwest Miniature Guy. He said, what determines your setup you're going to use for each video? Is it the song choice, the sound, or what the original drummer used? And you know, I love this question when I saw it. I was looking forward to talking about this one. I love to make a kit that mirrors what the other drummer, the drummer on the song, might have used. Now, notice I say might have used. Uh, today I did a gospel cover of a song by the New York City Choir, Community Choir. Now, I heard about this album when I was in college. And I used to go to a church, a pretty much a gospel church. It was a Bible study I would go to on Wednesdays. And a lot of the guys listened to a lot of music like the Winans and Andre Crouch and you know, Annabelle Hall, and they were listening to a lot of gospel choir music. And there was this one choir album from the New York City got a community choir that Steve Gadder, the rhythm, that rhythm section, that New York rhythm section played on the album. So I did a song called Rejoice, Rejoice. And I used this setup, which is reminiscent of a Steve Gadd setup. Now, I know Steve played with double-headed toms. Matter of fact, he went to great pains to make a fiberglass pearl concert tom kit turn into double-headed toms. And I, that was my plan, was to someday actually put these and make these double-headed toms. And to be honest, I'm not sure I'm going to do that ever. Um, I think about it now that I've got the 12. I bought this 12 recently. But um, here's what. I did this song today. Uh, my grandson filmed it, so he was filming me doing it. 
and I did it in a Steve Gadd configuration. So I got a 10, 12, 14, 16 hanging toms. Sounded really cool. When I do Danny Serafin, sometimes I'll set up a Danny Serafin uh, set. Um, I did that for, I forget which video I did. Um, I did Ballet for Girl in Buchanan, the whole thing, the whole ballet. Even though you can't really hear it because it gets blocked on YouTube because of Color My World and a couple other things. But um, I used a setup reminiscent of his kit. He used the first album where he had the... Um, he had a 13 and a 10, 12 concert tom and a 14 concert tom and a 16 floor tom and a 22 inch marine pearl rogers bass drum it's all marine pearl so i did a kit with a uh 12 inch tom a 10 inch tom and a 13 at the time and the 16 floor tom and it was kind of reminiscent of that kit that he used back early in the day um i've also set up the concert tom kit in a danny seraphim way so i do that but not all covers are that way. Sometimes it'll be the sound I'll go for, I'll, the way I muffle the drums. And I'll use the other kit, and it may not be in the configuration of the drummer. Um, but like I've done some Charlie Watts covers recently, and I have put the China symbol turned right side instead of upside down like this is. And I'll put it over here, and I'll hit it as a crash symbol like Charlie would. So I do like to play in character is what I'm saying, but not always. So it depends on the song. It depends on the mood I'm in. Some weekends I get a kit sounding good and I'll just use the kit the whole weekend. And other weekends I'm switching things around, switching cymbals around, trying to get that sound and that vibe of that drummer. So I hope that answers that question. But yeah, I, I definitely like playing in character. And when I do Jeff Picard, a lot of times I'll have that extra tom, the 10, 12, 13, 16 floor tom thing, or 14 floor tom that thing. Uh, I love the concert tom kits for certain era stuff, so I use it. Yeah, a lot of fun. All right. Let's see. What else do we got? Okay. Um, the next question. This is, this is a long question. This is six, seven questions. Seven questions in one. This is why I may have to go to a second show, okay? So if I do a second show, I may start with this question, just to let you know. All right, this is from Alan Ford. And Alan Ford says, questions. Um, this was on Ask Girl Anything. Finding inspiration, great drum sounds, drumsticks, bass drum beaters, and hobbies. I did talk about hobbies. <laughs> I just I started with hobbies again. That's funny. <laughs> it's even in the it's in the questions. You think if I read these ahead of time, it might be helpful, right? All right, here we go. <laughs> Alan Ford. Question number one. Opinions about the pearl free floating piccolo three and a half by fourteen brass. General opinion about free floating design. Using it as a main snare drum. How to get the best out of it. Um, head options, combinations, snare wire options that could work making it optimal. Chasing the Jeff Beccaro snare drum sound. Okay, I'll start with question number one. I owned a Pearl Free Floating 3.5 by 14 snare drum. I've told that story before. Um, and let me tell you, that's where my nickname, The Hammer, came from, was that snare drum. Here's... What I will tell you, it's it has some possibilities. I love, I like free floating snare drums. Matter of fact, if I could buy another one and find one cheap enough, I'd buy one. Um, especially with the die cast rims, because I had the one with the die cast rims on my Pearl uh, three and a half by fourteen. It had die cast rims on it. I found the best head that worked on it was the CS Black Dot. And by the way, CS Black Dot controlled sound coated is kind of this my favorite snare drum head. Um, I've tried the Emperor X, I've tried the extra thick CS head, I've used Power Strokes, I've used Ambassadors, I've used Emperors, I've tried Evans heads, um, G1s, I don't like G1s, G1s just do not sound good to me on a snare drum, sorry. Um, I've done a G2, I've done five, I've done just about every head there is, probably once. Um, even tried a, the Earth Tone Cat 
calf-like head, which is really, um, I think it's a goat head, by the way. Um, I gave that to my friend Scott. I don't know if he has it anymore. Um, but I think the best head for this drum is a coated black dot, CS black dot head is my favorite for the thing. I never changed the snares on it. The original snares had extended snares. They were 15 inches, I believe. I would stay with that. Um, so I wouldn't try a different snare option on that. But I, I like free floaters. And I like the brass free floater. And if I could find another one cheap enough, I'd buy it again. Just to have it in my collection more than anything else. Um, Jeff didn't use it that much. He used it in that video. that You made it famous in that video. Um, there's an interesting podcast called I'd Hit That. And... He, the guy who did I'd Hit That basically did an interview with Bill Denimore from Pork Pie Drums. And Bill Denimore talked about Jeff Beccaro's last tour kit, which was this blue Keller Shell Pearl kit. It was Keller Shell because Bill Denimore built the kit, put Pearl hardware on it, painted it this beautiful blue with black hardware on it. And Jeff used it on the European tour that was recorded with Toto in 1991. And Bill said, told the story about how Jeff really hated the Pearl drums. He did. And Jeff loved playing the Gretsch drums. So I can't imagine that the Pearl snare drums were his favorite either, to be honest. Um, I know he played Radio Kings, a lot of Radio Kings that Paul Jameson worked up for him. And I know he played Ludwig drums, so he had some Superphonics and those kinds of things you know, those types of drums, but I don't know. I think the piccolo was the sound of the 80s, the late 80s. So a lot of guys went to the piccolo sound and Jeff was one of them. But there was, a, Weckl made the piccolo really famous, if you ask me. Weckl's Yamaha brass piccolo was a famous sound too. Big, and one a lot of guys were going for. All right, number two, what's your opinion on six ply maple shell? The six ply shells have that extra something that resonates more and better or is it just sort of a difference in tonality? Oh, bet more or better, or is it nonsense? That's what he was asking. Uh, I read somewhere that Shannon Forrest interviewed, and he particularly likes the sound of six-ply shells. Does it really make some sort of difference in tonality? Okay, Alan, here's my opinion on that. Um, I use a Gretsch. Jasper shell drum. It's from 1979. Um, most actually, the only drum that I have that's Gretsch that's not from the Jasper era is a Catalina maple floor tom that I bought to go with my travel, um, my gigging kit, which has got an 18, 14 by 18 bass drum maple, 8 by 12 round badge maple uh, looking. Six and a half by ten concert time converted to double headed tom Jasper shell 70s maple with the badge stop sign badge. And then I needed a floor tom and I didn't want to spend a thousand dollars on a floor tom, so I bought uh, a Catalina club, a Catalina maple floor tom for 125 bucks. Put pearl die cast rims on both sides. Sounds pretty good with that kit, by the way. I don't think it makes that big of a difference. It doesn't have silver sealer. It doesn't have a Jasper shell, but it has bottom. Uh, I think the die cast rims make the Gretsch drums sound more like Gretsch drums than anything else, to be honest. Jasper shells are really important, I think, but not if you just need a drum to make it work. So um, do I think it has to be the maple shells? Um, I don't, I don't know, man. I think different drums have different sounds. You know what I mean? And it's what you like. I have found that the, the Gretsch drums sound the way they sound because of the 30 round over, the die cast hoops, the silver sealer, and the Jasper shell, which is maple gum. Maple. Gum wood's in the middle of it. So it's not a traditional six-ply shell. It's got gum wood in it. So that's what makes Gretsch what they are. Now, a six-ply maple, I don't know. I think they're a dime a dozen, number one. Everybody makes a six-ply maple, it seems like, these days. Um, it just comes down to what you want. I think we're, we're all stuck in marketing hype. You know, like, is the 2002 better than the 2000? There's differences. What 
does it do to your ears? What do you like? I like the 2002s, to be honest. I love a set of 2002s complete with the, the hi-hats, but you know what? I didn't want to spend 400 bucks on hi-hats or 450 bucks on hi-hats. So I found these Peisty 2000s and put this together for about 200 bucks or 225 bucks. When push comes to shove is what makes your ears tingle. Um, I would, I love birch shell drums. I love fiberglass shell drums. I've had plexiglass drums. Um, my favorite wood drums that I've ever played, um, is mahogany. I love mahogany drums. And Gretsch makes a, this little Catalina club kit, which is really cheap. The cheapest of their, their line pretty much that sound amazing and they're they're mahogany. So, go figure. If I could get a, I matter of fact, I played on a pearl mahogany kit, professional level, that were amazing. I wish, I wish I had that set. They sounded incredible, so fat and warm. Some of the old Ludwig, fifties Ludwig's mahogany sound fat and warm. So it's just what you want, man. It's just what it's only what you want. It's your ears. I think there's just too much hype. That's my that's my experience with that. Okay, question number three. Best budget replacement snare drum that could work equally well as a Ludwig Superphonic or Black Beauty from other manufacturers, etc. Um, I think the Ludwig Black Magic would probably get you in the ballpark of a Black Beauty. And that's cheaper than a Black Beauty. So I would start with that. But there's other guys that make that same Black Magic shell and they make, you know, a Black Beauty ish type drum. Pork Pie would make one with that shell. I think they're all getting those shells from Taiwan or China somewhere. Um, the difference in the, in, the, in the Ludwig Black Beauty shell is it's heavy. It's that 1.2 mil thick brass beaded shell, it's spun. Spun brass, it's not, there's no weld on it. That's the difference. Now, any brass drum has got a brass sound, so it's got that warmth, but still metallic sound. Um, I love my Black Magic 7x, I mean 8x14 that I have. And I paid 228 bucks for it from some, it was B-Stock. It was a B-Stock Black Magic, and I got a, I didn't know the difference. I didn't really know what B-Stock was, apparently. I thought I knew what B-Stock was. But then when I bought this Black Beauty this year, I found out what B-Stock was. B-Stock for a, a Pro-Line drum is you don't get a label in it. <laughs> you don't get the heads they put on the normal drum. You get all kinds of other stuff. But the one thing you do get is you get the correct shell and you get the correct hardware and you get the correct rims and the throw off. And I can't find the blemish on the drum and it sounds like a Black Beauty. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a Black Beauty. And maybe it's got the B-Stock badge on it instead of the Keystone, but it's still a great drum. So, but if you want a Black Beauty sound, buy a Black Beauty. But I think um, Pork Pie makes something. There's the World Max that's kind of in the Black Beauty realm. The guys have kit made that drum. It sounds like a Black Beauty a lot. Pearl, Pearl's got a drum that's kind of a Black Beauty, I believe, too. Um... I don't think you can get it anymore, Steve Ferroni. I think that uh, Manu Caché used to have a drum from... And by the way, you find a per, uh, Steve Ferroni or you get a Manu Caché drum, which are modeled after Black Beauties, by the way. Those drums are going to cost you more than a Black Beauty today because they're signature drums and they don't make them anymore. So they used to be cheaper, but they're not cheaper anymore. Um, yeah, that's my opinion on that. All right. Number four. From Alan Ford still. When buying a cymbal, is it enough to be chasing the same alloy, B20? In your experience, what brand of cymbals match the Zildjian K Darks? Well, that's a great question, by the way. Um, I will tell you that when it comes to B20 cymbals, you can put Istanbul's, Zildjian's, Sabians, you can put them all together. They all work together very well. They don't, matter of fact, you can make any two symbols work together. I have 
I have a set of Sabians. I have a set of Zildjians. I've got a few Istanbuls. Uh, I've had Peisty 602s. I have one 602 ride. I mean, I could put my Peisty B8s with my Zildjians that I have, and they work fine. But I would say from the dark K line symbols, you'd want to go with Sabian HHs or kind of similar. But to be honest, I'm a snob when it comes to Sabian symbols. I don't really dig the newer symbols as much, to be honest. And I've become more of a Zildjian guy again because I started buying newer Zildjians and I bought the Krope line. And the Kropes are extremely dark symbols. So the Krope dark symbols, they may not work with the Ks. I mean, they may be darker than the Ks. But I have a set of Kropes and I throw in my 80s 18-inch um, sound control HH crash ride. And that with the 19-inch Karope and the 22-inch Karope and the 14-inch Karope hats sound beautiful together. So I, I mix and match some Sabians in with my Zildjians occasionally, more often than anything else. Um, there's no reason why you can't do that. But, you know, I think there's a lot of Istanbuls. I think there's a lot of symbols made in Turkey for other companies that may work with Zildjians too. I mean, anything that's B20 and it's made in other countries might work with Zildjians. You just got to listen to the symbol and see if it matches what you want. I have this thing about putting symbols of the same type together, though. That's my kind of thing. But when I play in church and I pull out that Sabian HH, I'm bringing it out there for a sound. It's a certain sound. That, draw, that symbol has a certain sound. That's why I use it. And it goes well with the crows. So, all right. Number five for Alan Ford. Uh, how does the sound change using Remo Diplomats versus Remo Ambassadors clears as Rezos? Okay. Um, to be honest, I I don't think I've ever... No, I may have done Diplomats a long, long time ago. By the way, on my Gretsch kit right now, I've got Remo Ambassador Coateds over top of Remo Ambassador Coateds on the bottoms. For years, I used Remo Cat. I, I used Remo Clear Ambassador bottoms, and um, I just switched out my bottoms and put on the coated bottoms, the coated um, Ambassador bottoms. So um, that's where I'm at. You know, I don't need to use clears on the bottom. They sound great. Coated, coated sounds great. My, my when I bought the Gretsch kit, it came with Gretsch Permatone, which were essentially Remo Ambassador heads. Of course, I was in college. I wanted my drums sound like Steve Gadd's drums, so I eventually put Evans Hydraulic heads on those drums at one point. Um, and I did not dig the Gretsch Permatone. Probably I would dig them today because I know what to do with a medium weight head and make it sound good. I love Remo Ambassadors. I love Remo Vintage Ambassadors. I love Remo Emperor coateds. All those coated heads I love. Um, clear heads, nah, you know, I don't know, not so much. As far as a Rezo, Rezo head, yeah, Clear Ambassador works great. And I had Clear Ambassadors for 20 years on that drum. About 20 years those bottom heads were on. I didn't change them for 20 years. Matter of fact, that's a question I got from another guy. And um, I should give him credit right now because I'm not going to go back and re-talk re about this, but... It really does bring up that that question. So let me find that question. It came from, I got to come back to this one in a minute. Um, who sent me that question? Da -da -da -da. I know, oh my gosh, I got a lot. I think I'm going to have to do another, another episode. I don't think I'm going to get through this. Oh. oh, this is from Mickey F. Mickey F said to me, he says, you mentioned drum heads. How often do you replace your rezo heads on your drums? Obviously not on the concert toms. Well, Mickey F, this is Alan asking an Alan answer an Alan Ford question. To be honest, I didn't change them on my Gretsch drums for 20 years. That's the answer to that question. So if they're not, it's not as important as you think. That's what I'll say that. Um, I think clear dips may be kind of cool. Um, you know, I don't think I've done that. 
you know, if I did it, I did it a long time ago, like 20, 30 years ago. So, anyhow. All right, number five question, Alan Ford. Best drum head combination, in your opinion, for bigger power toms? You know, I hope you're getting this picture, Alan. This is what I hope you're getting. Is you want a sound, you try something different. Last weekend, I wanted a different sound on my concert toms. I had just taken off the Evans hydraulic heads off of my travel kit I was using in church. And the reason for that was I was tired of that sound. Now, in this church, with the, the high ceiling and everything and playing without microphones, those Evans hydraulic heads sounded booming in there. They sounded great. So when I took them off the drums, I put the old G2s back on, and I did put the old G2s that weren't too overly worn out on those drums, put them back. And I, I came in here and I put them on my concert toms. I thought, great, I'm going to have the GAD sound. I may buy a whole set of hydraulics. Well, after one week of playing those drums in here with the hydraulics and three covers with it, I don't want hydraulics on these concert toms. They are too dead. But... tuning after the last cover pinstripes a little different pins were the remo alternative to hydraulics um i dig the pins the pins work so what am i saying you want a sound you buy a head for a specific sound you try it you see what you like i love all my gretsch drums ambassadors over ambassadors i just told you that and they sound huge. Um, if you want slut, you want you want fatter, huge than the mid rangey thing of the coated ambassadors. I would go with vintage ambassadors over the uh, clear or coated bottom ambassador. Great sounding drums. Uh, vintage ambassadors are two ply. Um, it's seven and a half and a three mil, or maybe it's seven and a three and a half mil. Um, it's not quite an emperor, but it's about 10 and a half mil thick. If you want really fat, you go for coated emperors. It works for the concert times. I freak, I, I started, I bought a whole set of ambassador clears. They were really cool. They just, you just go through them fast. Then I put the coated, the clear emperors on for the last nine months. Sound great. They're still not worn out. Probably will come back on here one day. Now I'm going to pinstripes. Why am I going to pinstripes? Want a little different sound. Every once in a while you want a different sound, you change your heads. Um, I love Remo heads. Some guys love Evans heads. G2 sound great. Um, I've always liked the G2s. I'm not a big fan of the EC2s. I have a set. Not a big fan. I never really played the etched heads. Don't really know what they sound like. The Evans 56s were so reminiscent of fiber skins, the old fiber skins. I would buy a set of the Evans 56s. Maybe that's what I should buy on my Gretsch kit next time, the Evan 56, is just to try it. But I will tell you for recording, those coated ambassadors work. They work really well, and that's why a lot of studio guys have used them for years. That, or the coated emperors, or the coated vintage ambassadors, or the coated vintage emperors. Those four heads sound great on my Gretsch drums all the time. Never have a problem. Now, for a deep power tom, I don't see a big difference. If you want the real fat power tom 80 sound, get pinstripes. Everybody was playing pins back in that day. All right. Question number six. Pinion, clear batter snare? No. <laughs> That's my opinion. You want my opinion? Coated batter snare heads on snare drums. Period. Uh, 42 strand wires, uh, I think they work, and I'll show you. This is my Black Beauty. Um, it's a little beat up, but it's got a 42 strand on it. Works great on this drum. I haven't put the 42 on the new Black Beauty, but I'm thinking about it. Right now, I got a 30 strand on that. Um, that's an interesting combination. It's working. By the way, the secret of the Black Beauty and the, and the Superphonic. This is the secret. You tune it completely 
the right tuning. And then when you need that fat thing, you go over to the lug kind of across from where you're hitting and you detune that lug. Just de just womp it detune. Almost like there's like nothing there. Like there's like a little cave in. And that makes that fat sound so fast, it's not even funny. You don't have to do nothing to your drum, pretty much. Um, go straight to that fat sound. Anyhow, that was a bonus. All right, Alan, I think I gave you all the questions you're allowed to have for the show. So thank you for, thanks for asking that question. I have some more questions. And I think I'm going to have to cut the show right here and do the last set of questions. So thank you for watching Ask Girl Anything. Your questions make the show. And I appreciate you all being on the show and listening. This is part one for February. I will release part two in February, I promise. This will be an extension of it. Thanks for watching.